Welcome to Digital Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and I'm so glad to have you along with us today. I'm very honored to present today's program, which highlights the contribution women have made to American diplomacy. And in today's program, we will highlight the work of Eugenie Anderson and my friend and colleague, Dr. Allison Mann, NAMAD's uh, public historian, will be joining us later in the program. But first, I want to make sure that all of you watching today are a part of the National Museum of American Diplomacy social media channels. So you're all watching this program on our website. So if you just want to scroll down, you will see our social media icons. Please follow us. Join our email listserv so you can receive notices about forthcoming programs. We would love to stay in touch with you. The mission of the National Museum of American Diplomacy, or NOMAD, is to share the stories of, of American diplomacy through artifacts, exhibits, and programs like this one. But it is also our mission to share the history of the State Department, uh, which, as the first federal agency, is integral to the history of the United States. So as our country is celebrating the centennial passing of the 19th Amendment this year, we wanted to be a part of that celebration. So our um, curatorial team called the annals of the State Department history and have uh, isolated some stories of the contributions that women have made to the State Department through an online exhibit called Her Diplomacy. And I wanted to call out some words from the exhibit that I think capture its essence, which is Nomad is celebrating women in diplomacy, women who have blazed trails, negotiated peace, served alongside their partners, strengthened diplomatic relations, survived dangers, and opened doors for sharing of cultures and ideas. So although there are so many women that, whose stories we'd like to share, they're really actually largely unknown. So I'm, I'm very happy to share with you. And what I'd like to do now is to share my screen. And although you are on our website, I would like to just take us there to show you the exhibit, the Her Diplomacy exhibit. Oops, let me go, let me move this down. Hold on, let me, here we go. Here is our homepage of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. Here you see a view of our museum and our preview exhibit, Diplomacy is Our Mission. Of course, you see our tabs at the top. Um, you can learn more about our forthcoming museum, the permanent um, museum. Learn about our educational programs and all the resources that we have there. Our exhibits, we have uh, many online exhibits, um, and then also our collection. We have over 9,000 museum objects, and we have some stories there that um, share about our collection. But what I'd like to do now, let's go back to our home page. Here we go. And take you to our featured online exhibit, Her Diplomacy. Here we are. And we begin our, we begin our exhibit with uh, the story of Lucille Atcherson, who in 1921 applied to take the diplomatic officer's exam. And of course, um, inspired by the newly won right to vote, for women to vote, she wanted, she developed an interest in international affairs. She wanted to join the diplomatic, um, become a diplomatic officer. She took the exam, she passed. Uh, becoming a diplomatic officer, paving the way for, for many women to join the diplomatic corps. Um, here's Eugenie Anderson. Uh, we have featured her here. We are going to learn much more about Eugenie in a little bit. We also have featured Kate Koob, who as a officer was one of the diplomats taken hostage for 444 days um, in Tehran, in Iran. We have uh, featured Claudio Agnasu, who entered into the State Department as a civil servant, became a foreign service officer, and dedicated her career to exchanges. We've also featured Ambassador Jean Wilkowski, who was our first female ambassador uh, in uh, Africa. And of course, our exhibit would not be complete by highlighting the contributions of our three female secretaries of state, Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, and Hillary Clinton. We have Eileen Malloy, who was one of the 
for a few female diplomatic officers who worked on arms control issues in the late 80s and was posted in Moscow um, during that time and traveled extensively into Kazakhstan. Also Ruth Kurtzbauer, who was uh, stationed in China and isolated parts of China in the 1980s as we were cultivating new relationships there. And Sylvia Blake, who as a daughter, sister, wife, and mother of foreign service officers, we highlight and celebrate her work as being a part of a diplomatic family. And Lois Roth, who in the 1960s was posted in the Middle East. So I encourage all of you to take your time, delve into these stories, learn more about these courageous and brave women in our Her Diplomacy online exhibit. But today's program actually focuses on Eugenie Anderson. So what I'm actually just gonna to toggle over here and start some slides as we begin to think about Eugenia's work. But I want to mention that in the museum, we think about diplomacy um, as building and maintaining relationships between countries. And in all the stories that we tell in our exhibits and our programs, we really wanna highlight that, that idea of diplomacy, but we also really want to think about the process of how our diplomats do that, the skills that they use, and the tools that they do to build and maintain those relationships. So as we think about Eugenie's work, I, be, before we, we invite our historian to the screen, I want to just put up a couple words here. And when we think about the skills of diplomacy, uh, I've, I've put a few of those skills up here on the screen for us to think about. Leadership, composure, and advocacy. And although you might be familiar with these words, the question is how do these skills apply to the work of diplomats? And I'm gonna pose that question to you. And if you feel so inspired, feel free to put some thoughts into the chat function, which is how would you imagine these skills being used in diplomacy? How would you imagine that a diplomat needs leadership or to show composure or to be an advocate in diplomacy? Feel free to share your thoughts in that chat function. We'll be checking it periodically if you want to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, and I also want to have uh, for you to have these words in mind as we learn about Eugenia's work um, and to help us further explore that I would love to invite my friend my colleague nomads public historian Dr. Allison Mann. Hi Allison. Hi Lauren. How are you today? Good. Thank you for joining us. Thank um, you for inviting me. You bet. So I know that you um, have learned so much about the work of Eugenie Anderson and we pulled some pictures here. Would love for you to share um, what you've learned about her work as a diplomat and the skills and sort of the tools that she's used to do diplomacy. Well, Lauren, um, just a really brief bio of uh, Eugenie Anderson. She was born Eugenie Moore in Iowa in 1909. And uh, she passed away in 1997. So, you know, one of the remarkable, uh, you know, aspects of her life is that she lived basically the entire 20th century. And, you know, what unfolded in America in terms of being on the international world stage just throughout the 20th century, you know, her life corresponded with that, which makes her instantaneously, you know, such an interesting figure. Um, so this photograph is of her and her sister, Mary. Um, even though born in Iowa, she attended college in Minnesota. And when she was in Minnesota, she met then her future husband, uh, John P. Anderson, and they would get married in 1930. Um, from then on, she became a Minnesotan and his family, John Anderson's family was from Red Wing, um, which is outside of Minneapolis, about an hour outside. So that was always home base, you know, for them, even throughout their international travels. But, but this picture um, and this time period is really striking because um, she's a very highly educated woman, you know, interested in, in the world and international affairs, but wasn't really paying too much attention like most Americans in the early 1930s when fascism started to take over much of Europe and the rise of Hitler. Uh, she determined in 1937 to go to Europe on a trip and she went with her sister and traveled throughout France and England. Um, and then when she crossed over into Germany in 1937, she saw a really stark difference. And I, and I want to you know, read from her own words what she saw. Um, she said, the day that they crossed over, the first thing I saw were little boys marching in the street goose stepping. 
And I remember my horror at this site and being suddenly really afraid of what was happening there and of the menace that this represented for our country too. So it was like a wake up, like a lightning bolt, you know, um, America being so isolated from, um, you know, Europe because of the Atlantic Ocean and the limitations on travel. Uh, it really, for the first time, kind of showed her what was possible and um, really started her idea about political activism. So she joined the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. and then World War II hit and she um, was very much active with the Red Cross. And it really wasn't until about the end of the war that she became politically active. She had young children at this time. So, you know, her role really started to develop. And uh, in 1944, she met Hubert Humphrey, who was then running for mayor of Minneapolis. And she was very impressed with him. And that's when she also decided to pick a political party. And so she determined to become a Democrat okay. and uh, started you know, being very active in campaigning. And this is where she really began that love of um, you know, and, and honing those skills of communication with political activism, with campaigning, and very quickly rose up in attention uh, in the in the party and became a delegate um, to the Democratic National Convention. And so when Harry Truman was elected president, her name was floated um, as a potential to become the first woman ambassador and uh, accepted. And they approached her with the idea of becoming ambassador to Denmark. Um, and she she accepted and she passed through the Senate without controversy, becoming our nation's first female ambassador. Excellent. Amazing. Such a such a lovely shot, too. Is that her sister there with her? That's her sister, Mary. OK, excellent. And, you know, I was uh, remiss in mentioning that um, some of the images that we're going to see have been generously um, sort of uh, the, the family, the Anderson family has generously given us permission to show. And I know they're in the online exhibit as well. Mm -hmm. They have been extremely generous. We're so fortunate. Yeah. Um, and they also shared their research with us as well and publications. Excellent. And the Minnesota Historical Society is a great wealth of information. Mm -hmm. They did an oral history with uh, Eugenie Anderson. Um, so this cartoon, <laughs> um, strange as it seems, it's kind of like a Ripley's Believe It or Not sort of riff. There's uh, Eugenie Anderson, though other women have represented the United States in foreign countries, the first woman to carry the title of ambassador. And she's there with a snake and, you know, a bird and a hummingbird. And, you know, it, it, it's just a it's sort of interesting kind of commentary about, you know, how extraordinary this, this was to, to some people, you know, even though she did go through the Senate with confirmation without controversy, it still was was quite, it brought up this very interesting idea, you know, were women well suited to represent the United States abroad? Could they mm -hmm. make great leaders abroad? Could they represent the United States of America? Indeed. Mm -hmm. I love the pearls though. Yes, the signature pearls. Right there with the pearls. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, being relatively uh, a young mother, um, and, and as did most uh, male ambassadors at the time too, if they had you know children under the age of 18, they would go with their families abroad. And Ambassador Anderson was no exception to that. Here she's featured with her husband, John, mm -hmm. and her two children. Hans is on the left, and he would have been around 12 years old at this time. Okay. And then Johanna, who was the older of the children, but, but a teenager. And this shows them traveling. Uh, going over to Denmark. And one of the things that I found really interesting that the family told us was that they brought their personal vehicle because uh, they, they loved travel and they very much wanted to explore, um, you know, the nation when they were there. Excellent. All right. So this is interesting, right? Yeah, very. Is diplomacy a woman's <laughs> job? That's to the point there, isn't it? And she's features on the cover. Uh, this was... Yeah. Quick Magazine, which was a really popular circular. It was it was a little small kind of pocket-sized magazine that was popular in the uh, 1940s, 50s, and 60s. That was sort of like a, a quickie news, you know, uh, pamphlet that you would grab at the newsstand and no more than 15 or 20 pages to it. And so here she is juxtaposed with Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, after her husband, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's death, Eleanor Roosevelt served as a delegate to the United Nations and is considered to be one of the first and foremost experts on foreign policy, you know, during this time. And so with Anderson's appointment as ambassador, you know, did broach this question, um, along with many others. Uh, you can see here in the article, they talk about 
uh, Pearl Nesta, who was uh, serving in Luxembourg as chief of mission, minister to that legation. And also at the bottom, there are women serving in Brazil and also mm -hmm. out of India. And so the answer to this is um, maybe a little bit surprising to our audience is yes, absolutely diplomacy is a woman's job. And the article, it describes how they are more than capable right. of, of uh, conducting diplomacy on behalf of the United States. Right. And if we think about the skills that we mentioned in the beginning, leadership, composure and advocacy, you know, you, one of the words that you mentioned uh, was activism in, in her work. And I mean, you certainly see where all of these things kind of come together in that. And so, of course, that she would bring all of those skills to her work. Uh, so the family lands in, in Denmark. And, um, you know, one of the things that is most striking about her figure to her staff is the effort that she really puts into the job. And this is part of what makes a good mm -hmm. leader, right? Mm -hmm. You have to serve as a role model for your staff. And one of the, the skills that she took upon to really learn was a communication skill. So mm -hmm. she learned how to speak fluent Danish. Mm -hmm. And this was very impressive to her all male staff. You know, one mm -hmm. of them commented in an oral interview years later that he had never seen any other politically appointed ambassador take the time to learn to do this. And I do want to make that distinction too, that, you know, she was politically appointed ambassador. Mm -hmm. So we have two types of ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Now, there are the political appointees who are appointed by the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And then there are the career foreign service mm -hmm. um, ambassadors who rise up through the ranks of the foreign service. Mm -hmm. They're also appointed and they have to go through the Senate confirmation, but mm -hmm. we have the two. So that was considered to be, you know, really remarkable. And the reason why she did it mostly was that she could talk to the people, the Danish okay. people. And this again speaks to, you know, a, a very astute understanding of diplomacy because during this time period, diplomacy was often conducted between heads of state, um, your, your political counterparts. But um, Ambassador Anderson well understood that uh, the hearts and minds of the people were going to be crucial to the success of her mission in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And she embarked on what she deemed or called people's diplomacy, which now mm -hmm. we use regularly. We call it people to people diplomacy. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a very you know well established and accepted form of diplomacy where you connect people, you build relationships with the people. And I love this photograph because it shows her, yeah. you know, making a really strong connection with these women in a Copenhagen fish market. I, the woman appears to be holding up, I think, an eel um, <laughs> at the fish market, and you know. Presumably, Ambassador Anderson is, is inquiring, you know, in Danish. Well, she does look interested, though, too. I mean, she's she wants to know what's going on here. Exactly. And um, she became an extremely popular figure with the Danish people. You know, she did have her official charge um, when she went over as ambassador. Uh, she was to negotiate a, a trade deal. Um, with Denmark. And also uh, the, the United States was very interested in building air bases around uh, Northern Europe as a way to counteract um, the Soviet Union. And mm -hmm. so this is also the same year in 49 that NATO was established, the North American mm -hmm. Treaty Organization. And so she, she does have those um, you know, important duties as well. But I don't want to um, underemphasize the importance of, of speaking to the people mm -hmm. because it's often through the people and making the connections with the people that you can then influence the government. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. What a great photograph. Mm -hmm. Wow. And another uh, tool, uh, we can talk about the tools of diplomacy that ambassador would use because you have your skills, um, you know, that you use in diplomacy, but then you have to implement those skills. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that Ambassador Anderson did this was via radio because, mm -hmm. you know, she could only meet so many people out on the streets of Copenhagen, right? Or driving around in her car. Right. But this tool, the Voice of America in particular, enabled her to broadcast. And what an impression of Ambassador Anderson giving these speeches in fluent Danish Danish, you know, to the people of Denmark and what, what a strong connection she could make with them sitting in their living rooms. And she would use the tool of radio and also use the tool of yeah. giving public speeches 
to communicate very well to the people. And I just want to mention, uh, we talked about this a couple of times, Lauren, a speech that she made at a festival. It was on July 4th and she had been invited to speak. And uh, it was a very popular festival. And the King of Denmark also came and, and made a speech and 30,000 people attended this festival. Wow. That was a huge crowd. Right. And so there she got up and delivered her speech. And when she was done, just thunderous applause to the speech. And the PAO officer, the public affairs officer of the embassy, you know, just kind of said to her and half joking said, oh, you got more applause than the king. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of upstaged the upstage, yeah. the, but it was, yeah. it was half joking. What again just shows, um, you know, what a popular, impressive figure that she was serving. Love it. But, and what she brings to bear, you know, in this position. Yeah. Excellent. Um, for Senate. So for Senate, right? Um, so after administrations conclude and new presidents come, so when um, Eisenhower assumed the presidency, he was a Republican, um, she resigned her position as is common for politically appointed ambassadors, but uh, determined to you know, keep her career going. And she will be very active throughout the 1950s um, in state politics and national politics. And she will put her bid in uh, to run as the Democratic uh, US Senator to represent the state of Minnesota. Uh, she does not win that nomination, um, but it, it again shows her, um, uh, her people to people skills. So skills that she had sort of honed on the campaign trail for Hubert Humphrey and other Democrats. She really took that skill with her as ambassador to Denmark, you know, continuing to make connections. And then once again, when she returned to the United States and embarks, mm -hmm. you know, advocating on her own behalf to become mm -hmm. senator, uh, mm -hmm. continues to use those, um, you know, really excellent skills that she had honed. And mm -hmm. I love that we have a, a color photograph here. I do. Know, um, yeah, because yeah, color photographs during the 50s are are kind of rare. You know, unusual. Yeah. Black and whites. I love the button too. I love it too. And it, it continued to really keep her name out there in mm. democratic circles, you know, and, and that's going to be important as we move on to talk about her, her tenure behind the Iron Curtain. Yes. So here we are. Yeah, here we are. What a different post <laughs> from Denmark to Bulgaria, right? Uh, you know, it, it, it could not have been more different. So Bulgaria at this time is part of the Soviet bloc. Um, you know, it is a communist government, very oppressive. And she was in her, in her own way, um, a cold warrior. You know, when we talk about uh, cold warriors in terms of diplomacy, you know, they, they, it's a philosophical term to describe diplomats who, uh, you know, worked very hard to decrease the influence of the Soviet Union. And they also worked on nonproliferation, um, you know, mm -hmm. trying to ease tensions. And, and that's very much what she wanted to get across when she went to Bulgaria. Okay. Um, you know, very firm in her belief in American democratic capitalist, you know, systems, uh -huh. free trade, free markets. Um, she even called in her own words, uh, she referred to communism as an inhuman, stupid, cruel system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's how vehemently that she felt about it. And she knew that she, this was going to be a, a tough position. You know, she knew that going into it. And um, so how did she get there? Uh, she had served as foreign policy advisor to Adlai Stevenson when he ran unsuccessfully for the presidency. And then when John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, was elected in 1960, um, her name was floated. Uh, in front of him by Hubert Humphrey, who would remain very prominent and was a longtime senator from Minnesota. And Kennedy had been quite impressed at her use of people to people, mm -hmm. diplomacy, um, people's diplomacy, as she called it. And he thought that she would be a very good candidate to go into a country that was so repressive. And he had a lot of confidence that she would be able to build relationship with the people. Because as history has showed us, when communism did begin to fall, it was because of the people mm -hmm. that made that fall happen. And Anderson is unique in this regard that I think she knew back in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that it would come from the people, that it would mm -hmm. be people who would eventually change the political system. 
Incredible. So we've learned that she was the first female ambassador, which was to Denmark, which unto itself is just very impressive. And what she did to fulfill that role in learning a language and the people to people. But this slide says U.S. minister to Bulgaria. So how, how are those two kind of positions different? Well, it's not a demotion. Um, it's also chief of mission. So um, generally, you know, in State Department lingo, when they say chief of mission, that's that's the head of the mission. So the role, the title of minister goes with the size of the mission. And at this time, we still had missions that were not embassies, but they were legations. And legations were just smaller presences. It really has to do with the size and strategic importance. And in, during the 60s, um, Bulgaria was one of the last um, legations to be turned into an embassy, which happens in 1966. So most of the legations around the world, as the United States grew in its size and its scope, they did convert them from legations to embassies. And then you had the title of ambassador. So she is chief of mission, but her title is U.S. minister to Excellent. the legation okay. in Sofia, Bulgaria. Okay. So she knew what she was getting into. Yeah, she did know what she was getting into. She knew that she was walking into um, a very repressed um, country where it was going to be, uh, you know, a bit more, a bit more challenging. Um, simply because she knew that she was going to have the Bulgarian authorities constantly watching her every single move that she made. And but she nonetheless, um, you know, I think this again shows her leadership how she served as an example to um, the legation staff, um, you know, how you take the circumstances of your post to the political realities and you rise to the occasion. Um, that also has to do with her composure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a difficult posting and you, you know, as a diplomat that you're going to run into some very difficult situations and you have to keep your cool. Right. You know, the Bulgarian authorities are just waiting for you to crack and make uh -huh. a scene. So they have every excuse to wow. throw you out of the country, right? right? Or create a diplomatic mess out of the entire thing. So it was even right. more important that you keep your composure and your cool. And, and, in, and in this photograph, which is, it's just beautiful. I mean, she's still with people. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. The Bulgarians were invited to come into the legation and, um, you know, here she is uh, seen signing something for them. And the thing that I love about this photograph is you've got them looking so intently mm -hmm. on, on what she's doing. Um, that little boy there with his, you know, his cap and everything. Yeah, leaning just, over. Yeah, leaning over, looking so intently. And even in this, uh, this voiceless photograph, we can see that she's making a connection with these people. She's building a relationship. Mm -hmm. with the people of Bulgaria, despite, mm -hmm. you know, all of that problems with Bulgarian authorities, they can't stop her from doing this. Amazing. Uh, love, love it. I know, I love this picture. Um, again, having a personal vehicle was very important uh -huh. uh, to uh, Eugenie and John when they went to Bulgaria. And the family recently shared the story of this Mercedes with, with us that we just found so fascinating. She was so... Um, you know, anti-communist that they did not want to purchase any vehicle, you know, in, in Bulgaria, <laughs> or even if they could buy one. So uh, her husband, John, bought this Mercedes in West Germany. And because West Germany at the time oh, was a democratic country and a strong ally of the United States, and they wanted to support, <laughs> you know, the West German um uh, the West German car manufacturers. And so he drove that Mercedes all the way from West Germany to Bulgaria. And even when it had to be serviced, he would drive it back to West Germany, you know, to get it serviced. But uh, there they would travel um, all around Bulgaria in this personal Mercedes. The Mercedes uh -huh. went back with them to the United States when they left Bulgaria. Amazing. Well, in that way, she's advocating for that for that democratic ideal, you know, and purchasing yeah. that and driving it all. Yeah, I've been, mean, you know, very, very astute, very smart. Yeah, that's a good point. She is advocating for, you know, capitalism just in, in her purchases, right? Mm -hmm. um, Love so, this photograph. It's yeah. so, so sweet. It's very real. Very and, real. you know, Lauren, we all, uh, our entire team at the museum, we often talk about how sometimes it's very difficult to get pictures of diplomats in action because normally it's like a posed photo where they're signing mm -hmm. a treaty or something like that, or the diplomats behind the scenes taking the picture. Um, but a lot of these pictures uh, were taken 
by her husband, John Anderson, who was an excellent photographer and he was an artist. And so he knew really how to capture a pose. And uh, you know, we're so fortunate to be able to, to have these mm-hmm. photographs to show this. And I think, you know, we don't even really need a caption for this. It just shows mm-hmm. a, a genuine affection that everywhere she met when she would reach uh, the people in Bulgaria, you know, she was so vivacious and approachable. And she did learn also to speak Bulgarian. You know, we were just talking about this before we went live. I, I can't even imagine. I mean, she herself was very artistic and an excellent pianist. And so I think she really just had a knack for languages. Mm-hmm. You know, she was mm-hmm. able to speak Bulgarian. But, you know, to be able to drive around the countryside and to meet a villager and talk to them about America and advocate, advocate for the United States of America in a subtle way by making a personal relationship with someone um, was exactly what I think, you know, Mm -hmm. Kennedy had hoped for. Mm, Excellent. Amazing. And here we are again. Big, old and old and young. Old and young. yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Um, you know, showing showing her interacting with this this little girl uh, on the street. You know, as as presumably you know her grandmother you know leans down and, and takes yeah. a look at her, but um, you know just so likable. And uh, the Bulgarians um, who met her, they they called her uh, babichka. You know, this this very sweet term for for grandmother. So mm-hmm. she had that that very grandmother feeling. But mm. you know, as, as we move on the slides, don't don't take that grandma image, you know, too much for granted, right? Yes, right. Well, <laughs> right. this this is interesting too because the gentleman on the left looks like he's uh, closely observing what's happening here. Right. I alluded to the constant surveillance that they were under and how hard of a posting this was. Uh, the Andersons, along with the legation staff, knew that the legation was bugged. And so they had one safe room in the legation that they could speak freely that they felt was was private. But um, Anderson also knew that their house was was bugged. And so when she wanted to have conversations with her husband, they would write things on slips of paper and then tear them up and flush them down the toilet. Um, so always under the watchful eye. And, you know, here, you know, she just couldn't care less about that guy being a foot away from her, you know, just checking it out as she makes this connection with this woman. It looks like they're looking at um, maybe dried chili peppers. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's there's a men in the background kind of like, hey, what's what's that all about? Right. Because, you know, when she would go in to talk to the people in the marketplace, she would drive for that Mercedes, <laughs> into the crowd, you know, so already she's making that entrance like here I am I'm coming through and get out of that Mercedes and just start going out and shaking hands you know shaking hands talking to them making that connection and after a while uh the authorities would just kind of like hustle her along like okay okay Okay, here she is I think we have this picture kind of also gives you that feeling as well very genuine she's so genuine Yes, exactly. But, you know, in a lot of these photos, you're always going to see a man in mm-hmm. the uniform, you know, just mm-hmm. checking her out and watching her. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, the fields. Oh, this is great. Okay. So this is where it's like, okay, she's, she's dressed to the nines all the time. You know? <laughs> yeah. This is a very well-dressed babichka grandma, but, you know, she's not afraid to get her feet dirty. And this is, too, also where, you know, she takes her expertise and, you know, being an advocate on behalf of the United States is not just about political systems, but it's also about uh, your knowledge sharing, right? So sharing the knowledge of agriculture, she felt was extremely important um, in really helping the lives of the Bulgarian people. Because as a Soviet bloc country, all the produce that they grew, the best of it went to the Soviet Union as part of the collective. And so, while she was in Bulgaria, she really talked up agricultural practices mm-hmm. in America. Being from a farming state, she understood a lot about dairy farming. Um, here, I think it's a potato field. And I don't know what they're looking at, but, you know, she's right there. She on- fits right in. She fits right <laughs> yeah. in. Yeah. Other than the, the like, the, the pillbox hat. Everyone else has got babushkas on. Yeah, but they, they're surveying something. Presumably talking about, like, okay, well, you're going to do your next planting over there. And, you know, and she's in her she's in her nice shoes just out there in the field with the people love it um comment just came through about loving the juxtaposition of her grandmotherly and comforting ways <laughs> love that all right 
All so right, is this? Okay, so this is where you do not take Babichka for granted, right? Okay. Um, you know, because the Bulgarian authorities, she noticed from first, they, I don't think they took her that seriously, like, you know, that they were going to be able to kind of steamroll her, you know, and she thought, huh, you don't know what you're getting yourselves into. So this is a great example of, of that, you know, her composure, her enormous leadership skills, but also um, these tools of how you implement things. Every year in Plodiv, Bulgaria, there was an agricultural fair. And this was the time in the 50s and 60s when uh, expositions were very popular, even in Soviet bloc countries. And uh, this particular one was an agricultural fair, but the United States had, um, you know, like a little part of the pavilion to, to be able to demonstrate the best of America. So this is where public diplomacy is, is really strong when it really starts to, you know, we can talk about that after we finish talking about Anderson. Okay. Um, but public diplomacy uh, and, and how you, you bring out the best of America to the people and how you do that through these expos. And so in this particular agricultural fair, the, uh, the Americans had, you know, a setup. They had a setup showing the best of America. And so, you know, what are the things that you would have, right? Aside from being able to fly Elvis Presley over, you know, and sing hunk a hunk of burn love, you know, how else are you going to demonstrate America? Mm -hmm. uh, so in that pavilion, they had a Mercury spacecraft, you know, so that's again, sharing knowledge, sharing, sharing scientific knowledge. There was an American kitchen that would show the Bulgarian people technology also, you know, the newest, latest and greatest. And also a Ford Thunderbird, which I, I think oh, is how great. hilarious, yeah. a little bit of cultural, you know, and also American manufacturing yeah, yeah. for American manufacturing. So one of the more interesting things about what they were offering Bulgarians is a takeaway. And they, the, um, the legation staff had made this pamphlet that the Bulgarian people who attended the fair could take with them. And um, so it, it was, uh, you know, carefully constructed. The first couple of pages, there was a picture of President Kennedy. There was a picture of Minister Anderson. Mm -hmm. And then you had these photos depicting, mm -hmm. you know, the abundance of American life. I love this photo showing this well-dressed woman, you know, shopping at a grocery store, very well-stocked shelves. It's very modern also. Very modern. Yeah. And, you know, this is the best of what America had to offer. Mm -hmm. But the subtext to that is mm -hmm. that this is what capitalism gives you. Th mm -hmm. This is what America is really all about. So, you know, it's a, it's a overt yet subtle way of advocating for the United States of America. And, and they did their homework. They made sure that they had the Bulgarian officials clear this pamphlet mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. they started distributing it. And when they started giving it out, everybody wanted one. If you go to the next picture, Lauren. Um, oh my gosh, that's the pamphlet in the middle. That's the pamphlet. You know, they, uh, the legation staff was astonished. Astonished, wow. People mm -hmm. went wild. Everybody wanted one of these. And so the Bulgarian officials who were at the, at the fair were like, well, you know, what's going on over there? And they went over and when they saw that, you know, their people were really desperately trying to get one of these to take home with them, they're furious. And they started snatching them out of people's hands and kind of roughing them up in the process. And the legation staff, you know, told Anderson and Anderson was like, oh, no, no absolutely not. And she went and immediately confronted them and said, you know, we had this cleared. She right. was very calm, even though she was furious, she was very calm. We had this cleared. They're going to give this out. You were going to let the people take them and under no circumstances. And it's kind of funny in her oral interview, she said, um, uh, I was very firm and polite, but absolutely insisted we did have the right, you know, to give them out, saying, this means a great deal to me. Sorry. And I take that as like, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, but she's got so much integrity, I mean, as well, you know, and um, talk about composure. And what, what a leadership example, because it shows her own staff that she has their backs. Mm-hmm you know, that, that she is going to back them up mm -hmm, on this mm -hmm, and, and confront mm -hmm. them. And boy, mm -hmm. the, the trade minister said later on that he was shocked. He did wow. not know that mm -hmm. this American lady could be so tough. Do not underestimate. Mm -hmm. Do not underestimate Babichka. No. <laughs>
So one of the other notable confrontations occurred um, after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So when the news broke that he had been assassinated in November of 1963, um, Anderson, this is a photograph, I'm sorry, I should say, this is the outside of the legation in Sofia, the capital. And she would routinely display pictures of American life or what was kind of going on. These particular pictures happened to be of her, some of the photographs that we already saw, but she used them as, as her platform. And according to some of the legation staff, sometimes upwards of 5,000 people would walk past every day and look at these, at these photographs. Mm -hmm. And after Kennedy was assassinated, um, as often that occurs even now, when the people of a nation want to show their, mm -hmm. their feelings of, of solidarity and regret, they go to the embassies. And they, they go to the embassies to gather. They often leave notes. Um, and this is exactly what they did because they knew that the United States was suffering at the mm -hmm. loss of Kennedy. And so um, some like 800 people went inside the legation um, mm -hmm. to express their condolences. And this outpouring from the Bulgarian people outraged the Bulgarian authorities just absolutely outraged them. And so they kind of gathered up um, a few hundred thugs and um, there, was, there was kind of this riot outside the legation, not, not soon afterwards. And the windows were broken and cars were you know, turned over and legation staff was kind of beat up. Um, Anderson herself was not in the country at the time, but of course, you know, found out about it and was, you know, of course, absolutely furious. And mm -hmm. one of her uh, staff members remembered her getting on, the, getting on the phone and being, again, very polite and very firm saying, you did this, you are paying for this, you are replacing the windows, you will do this immediately. Mm -hmm. And then she hung up the phone and just exploded. <laughs> you know, So, um, you know, clearly, again, a perfect example of that skill of, of composure. And she would continue to stand up to the authorities, um, knowing full well that this was going to be a target. And she did not back down from continuing to put photographs in those windows. And the windows were broken a couple of more times. And each and every time she demanded that they replace the windows. You know, sometimes we talk about diplomats being that first line of defense. And I really feel like she's like on the front lines of diplomacy here, using, bringing these skills, using these tools to advocate for the United States, but also the democratic ideals that she she held so dear to her. And photographs are very much a tool of diplomacy. Um, you know, as, as you and I talked about just 10 minutes ago, you don't need to understand a language to understand the meaning right, of a photograph. photograph. Yeah. And so, you know, that picture of her with um, the older woman, I think is mm -hmm. like center stage here. So if you are someone, a Bulgarian living in Sofia, you, you see that relationship, you see that warmth that comes mm -hmm. through. You don't need to read anything. You don't need, there's no captions there. You, you don't, mm -hmm. there's no language barrier. Mm -hmm. Get around. Oh, I like her. Um, so she will leave Bulgaria in 1964. And, you know, her, by now, you know, her uh, knowledge and expertise as a diplomat and also her knowledge of internationalism and international affairs is, is tremendous. And she will become a delegate to the United Nations from 1965 to 1968, where she works on decolonization issues. Mm -hmm. And you know, this photograph here of her taken in New York um, mm -hmm. is very striking because it shows her with her counterparts, and um, you know, shows her adaptability, which is mm -hmm. again, you know, a, a great skill that diplomats use, you know, to adapt to other cultures and and really have that innate understanding that um, in order to make relationships, to build relationships, to mend broken relationships, that a cultural awareness and understanding and adaptability mm. are really key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> How do you sum up a, a, a life like that, right? Mm. Just, in, just in a half an hour. But we chose this last, um, picture to feature, you know, it's a beautiful color photograph of her um, out there enjoying herself and embracing, um, you know, life overseas and, um, you know, just fully at home in her surroundings. You know, there, there's so much emotion that, that comes out of this photograph. Lovely. Lovely. So to our 
viewers out there, we are taking questions. So if you have anything that you would like to ask Allison, um, please drop it in the box. We would love to, to hear anything that you have to say. But um, I, I wanna circle back around with you for a second, Allison, because after the legation, you, you mentioned um, while she was there, um, JFK was assassinated mm -hmm. while she was US minister to Bulgaria. How, what was that like for her? How, how did she deal with that? I mean, she was appointed by him. Did she have to go home? Like how, what, what, how did that work? Um, so generally, you know, uh, so when Lyndon Johnson became president, mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she would continue in, in her post. Um, but uh, she wanted to have a service for, you know, Kennedy in Bulgaria and uh, did so. And, um, you know, hoping that the, the Bulgarian government would have, you know, the, the decency to at least attend, you know, and have some kind of I don't know, emotion over some, you know, trauma that the United States had suffered. And uh, she was very you know, disappointed that um, a lower official kind of was sent to sort of, you know, represent oh, the, the Bulgarian. Right. Yeah. They were not fans of Kennedy. I mean, Kennedy, everything that he represented and exuded was antithetical to their, you know, promotion mm -hmm. of communism. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, yeah, it, it was definitely, I, th I think, uh, you know, something that she didn't appreciate. And that kind of speaks to that protocol aspect of diplomacy. Absolutely. I mean, when, yeah. a, head, when a head of state, you know, when the president of the United States is assassinated, you know, I think, I think she was hoping for, you know, something, something more, but what she got was the genuine, um, you know, uh, sadness from the Bulgarian people, which I think to her probably meant even more. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, I do have a question. What lasting impact did Eugenie Anderson have on diplomacy? I think it would be her, um, her astute um, way of understanding that diplomacy is about relationships and people, mm -hmm. you know, first and foremost. And, you know, and she does this in a time where, you know, it, it is a, a Cold War extravaganza, you know, when you have these competing political ideologies, but yet she demonstrated that even when you think that you cannot come to the table with people, that you can't, you can't communicate with them, that you have no um, common ground that she demonstrated through her work that you can always find common ground. Mm. And I wanna add that you mentioned the idea of public diplomacy and this idea of her connecting with the people. Um, how did that impact the work of ambassadors subsequently? I mean, it sounds like she was one of the first to kind of really get out there and, dirt and get her shoes dirty, essentially. She got in the fields for heaven's sakes. Um, did that kind of impact and change the way D ambassadors or diplomats practiced how they connected when they were in country? Yeah, absolutely. And it really changed the field. Um, you know, Lauren, maybe you could take a couple of minutes and just briefly tell our audience that public diplomacy, um, you know, we have diplomats out there who work specifically in public diplomacy because of its its effectiveness. Right. And it's a cone. It's, it's, it's a job that our diplomats, you know, serve in a position as a public diplomacy officer. And part of that job includes working with the press in that country and communicating um, sort of the United States foreign policy and our ideas in, to, to the citizens of that country. But it promotes, also promotes exchanges and both academic and cultural exchanges, um, brings people and conducts programs within the, um, the country for the citizens of that country to learn more about the you know, the way of life that we have here in the United States, um, sort of our sort of the the um, the culture. Uh, what I want to say, like the um, the culture, the movies, the things that we our music, the things that we consume, the things that are uniquely ours. Um, the public diplomacy officers in countries kind of help to communicate that in that country, and I think it sounds so much that she gave sort of space to that and that that really helped to impact how we connect with people and the importance of that. Absolutely. And she would offer um, cultural opportunities for mm -hmm. when she was in Bulgaria for the Bulgarian people to see. She brought over pianists, yeah. um, you know, had these literary things going on yeah. at the station. 
Yeah, excellent. Uh, another question, what, or rather, did the Bulgarians actually pay for the broken windows? Well, they're, yeah. They did. Okay. <laughs> the Americans says, did. <laughs> the, 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 the viewer says, I assume so, but it wasn't clear. So. Yeah. Yes, they did. They replaced them. They broke them again, and then they replaced them. Yeah. Oh, good for you, Eugenie, though. That's excellent. Um, wonderful. Well, Allison, thank you so much for taking the time for all of us to learn more about Eugenie, her contributions, clearly an extraordinary diplomat, um, but, but, but someone who was just dedicated to her country. And what I want to mention to the viewers out there, and I, and I hope you all go to our Her Diplomacy Online exhibit, because I think that word activism and a, and a, and a commitment to communities and, you know, the United States and our country, that sort of is a common theme through, through all of the women that we've highlighted, um, trying to make this world a better place. So um, you've really done that well here with Eugenia, Eugenie and helping us learn more about the skills of diplomacy and the tools that our diplomats use to do their work and to bring about diplomacy around the world and, and to bring about sort of the, the security and the prosperity and the democracy and development of, of our country abroad. So thank you so much. And thank you all of you for being out there today and joining us. Please continue to monitor our social media. Join us on Facebook and Twitter um, and Instagram so you can learn more about our forthcoming programs as well as our email listserv. So thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Thanks, Thanks Allison. Okay, see you soon. <laughs>